Okay, hello everybody out there. Um, I hope you already enjoyed the sessions with Eric Gamma, with Alan and with Mael. And I'm now happy to welcome Jason, the CTO of um, GitHub for a quick fireside chat about developer experience. So thanks for taking the time and welcome to the VaxConf, Jason. Um, I mean, I'm actually quite excited. I think this is my first uh, fireside chat in jogging pants. <laughs> so um, how are you today? <laughs> I'm good. It's a nice sunny day over here where I am. And I already got out for a nice walk with the uh, little puppy we have. So great. That is, what, what kind of puppy do you have? <laughs> so we, um, we got a Bernice mountain dog and she's about nine weeks old at this point. So full of energy, but also showing her future size already. So uh, we're in for uh, extended treat with this one nice that's that that sounds that sounds like fun times so i think maybe it makes sense to do a brief round of introductions and um and if you don't mind i'm happy to start so um i'm johannes one of the um, founders of um, gitpod um, the company that actually is behind um, this conference and i mean want to keep it brief so actually i think that's it and my career is also not as long and accomplished and impressive as yours jason so so over to you here well i think it, the the long part is what you were keen in on there um <laughs> so um yes i'm jason warner i'm the cto at github i've been at github about four years at this point prior to github i was the vp of engineering for heroku where i ran heroku engineering and part part of product for about three years and then before that, I ran um, engineering for a company called Canonical, people who make Ubuntu Linux. So I was in charge of Ubuntu for five years. And before that was a host of other companies that um, are as interesting as those three. Cool, yeah. Um, so and very, very relevant, I think, because we really saw the whole, um, um, the whole developer experience kind of movement from the um, beginning um, to where we are now and where we are headed in the future. So I think the kind of goal I have for the conversation is to yeah, allow myself, but I think also the audience to learn and also mainly listen to some of the more war room stories um, you experience throughout your career and potentially also extract one or the other tactical advice. Um, I think for either teams that are building tools for developers, such as GetPod, or teams that want to increase their um, developer experience and productivity of their own engineers, right? Yeah. Um, so to, to start, I'm kind of intrigued. What was the first piece of software that really felt magical to you in terms of developer experience? So there's pretty simple answers here. So I got into computing quite late. I didn't actually start programming until I was 18, um, going off to college. I didn't have a computer at home and all that. So, you know, I didn't really start programming until uh, around mid nineties, um, which, and then, uh, you know, by that time I started doing internet programming. And I, then I think that the tools just weren't that great, um, to be honest with you, even um, Microsoft hadn't been developing great tools at that point. So it took me a while. The first really magical tool I think I ever saw was Rails. When Rails came out and we saw that video that DHH put out there for the blog, kind of blew my mind. I was stuck in Java land for a long time. EJB 2.0, people who follow me on Twitter know how I feel about EJB 2.0, J2EE, this, all that sort of stuff. Then after that, it was, um, Git push Heroku master, Git push Heroku master at Heroku blew my mind in so many different ways. And that is what led me down the rabbit hole of developer experience, cloud developer oriented tools, platforms, all of those things in general. So the, the one I'm most obsessed with is Git push Heroku master because um, for its time, it literally was a spaceship being sent down to a very primitive population as far as I'm concerned, and it's still the best in the industry at what it does. Yeah, yeah, fully, fully, fully agree. And I mean, that actually leads leads quite well to the to the to the next um, topic, which I think it's fair to say that, you know, Heroku was among the first orgs that were really obsessively focusing on developer experience. And I think to date is probably still the example, like a lot of people reference right around that topic, um, similar to, to to yourself. I mean, you had it there engineering efforts for, I think, more than three years, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. So um, what do you think, what was kind of baked, you know, into the Heroku culture that really nurtured and or enabled that, 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 that focus back then? You know, we didn't have the words for it at the time, 
But I think that people at Heroku had that customer obsession that so many people talk about on a mm -hmm. daily basis now. But we just we just talk about it being dev first. Like developers are touching this every day. We need to understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, what their pain and frustration is. So one of the, um, the very very obvious key things was that everyone at Heroku, almost everybody, was a developer, and they used the product on a regular basis, and they wanted it to get better. Um, and I will go back to Twelve Factor. Um, the Twelve Factor app, I think, again, this goes to how forward thinking I think Heroku really was breaking down not just that the experience was there, but how to construct an application for a modern, a modern web application in a way that makes it very sustainable and, and can grow horizontally. And I think that with Get Push Heroku Master and that obsession with developers really was one of the secrets to Heroku. I also think it was one of its biggest frustrations then too, because the world didn't always work the way that we hoped it would in some cases. Um, and we hadn't evolved the product to the point where it would have be able to encompass Git Push Heroku Master with the multitudes of the ways in which developers in the world are going to work. Yeah, that 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 makes makes a lot of sense. Any kind of um, more detailed um, stories you can you can share about that frustration there and what maybe also has changed um, right now? Well, so the so I joined Heroku post acquisition by Salesforce. Yeah. So um, a lot of the pre-acquisition folks were still around, though the founders were not. And one of the interesting things that I saw was just like any startup as it grows, there's a very early cohort, a mid cohort and a late cohort. And I was part of the mid cohort, let's call it, of people yeah. who wanted the spirit of the early, but you want to scale it. And I think one of the interesting things that we saw as a frustration was uh, inside of Salesforce, a lot of the focus necessarily changed to a set of things that didn't allow us to complete the mission. The first part of Heroku was done. That's what got it acquired. But the next three, four, five steps that we wanted to do never really panned out. And they would have allowed us to become the serverless Heroku or the Kubernetes Heroku or a bunch of other things. But because we couldn't do that, we basically, we basically boxed ourselves into a corner of the market that we could serve. And when you take that and then you start to ramp up the revenue pressures, you stop focusing on how to expand and innovate and just really how to increment. And I think that frustration got to a lot of people, including myself, which was, we know we can do more and we're serving a set of people, but we're not broadly serving them. So my classic example that I talk about all the time is there is a person in the middle of the country, whatever country you're in, who is underserved from a um, product perspective because there's not a lot of money in their market, but they're a developer who goes to work every day hoping to make a living. Most people don't have that person as a persona that they want to serve. Heroku wanted to. They wanted every developer around the world yeah. to be served by them. And we just never were able to fulfill that. Okay, but others still, I mean, um, as, you, as you described, Heroku was really developer first and probably one of the first companies, probably they had no words for that, but they that really lived that, right? So what do you say there are kind of two, three really tactical things um, you learned um, during your time there that other companies can adopt and can learn yeah. from that actually build an engineering org that puts developer experience at the center and at the core of their product and building efforts? Well, so one, don't try, my opinion is don't try to find a way to quantify the value of developer experience. It's going to be very difficult to go do, just figure That's out true. that developer experience is part of who you are and why you're going to serve and what a differentiator would be. It'd be like Apple saying, um, our design aesthetic is valuable. Here's how valuable it's going to be. They just, you know, they just know that Apple just knows that this is part of who they are, what they're going to go serve. So just do that. The second is, um, this was a, a shortcut I learned from somebody at Heroku. I loved simple design specs. And this person um, basically designed everything with on Heroku on the command line, just showed command line Heroku new features running, and this is how it's going to work. And then you figure out everything else behind the command line running. And it took it took away distractions. What, you know, what X, Y, or Z is going to go to another, this is the developer experience. They're going to touch it this way. They're going to feel it this way. We did the same thing with the dashboard mockups when we were doing um, CICD stuff and pipelines. We just 
we didn't talk about some of the derivative effects of it. We said, this is what the experience of it's going to be. And it really helped us focus. And then um, a couple more things tactically is do not try to be everything to everyone right out of the gate. It just won't work. Pick a cohort of people that you really want to go serve um, and then serve them. But um, there's a concept of called 10 to 100 to 1,000 raving fans. Really hammer that home, build that out. Get 10 people who just can't stop obsessively using you and are talking about you. Build that out to 100, build that out to 1,000. Um, and even more tactically speaking, you're going to have to uh, have some sort of conviction around some element of what you do that will feel a little bit counterintuitive in, in all likelihood, or um, is, is different than what is happening in the market or open source or wherever. Um, but understand why, don't have religious dogmatic conviction around it, have some, so, some sort of pragmatic, we can verify or talk to people who can help us understand if this is indeed something that we can actually go and do. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. When you speak about this kind of um, picking the first um, 10 or 100 people um, there, I think this is also something we really saw um, at Gitpod that if you want to have that frictionless experience, you cannot build it for everybody, right? Especially especially in developer tooling. Um, how would you say, how, how do you kind of approach that? Should you grow with communities or how do you, you know, pick that kind of niche? There, th this is a, it depends answer entirely based on what you're building. Yeah. So if you're building something where it makes sense to go with a community, you know, a Rails or a Next or a Gatsby or whatever, figure that out and then go to that community and go build with them if you can. If it's a language or if it's an ecosystem, maybe you're building something that just works inside of Amazon or Azure or GCP ecosystems, or you're doing something that's broad sweeping across the Java landscape as opposed to the specific frameworks. You, all of those things will likely change. But what doesn't change is inside of there, inside those communities, the ecosystems or whatnots, there's what you can call anchor, either anchor people or anchor pillars or anchor, anchor um, services. So a good example is if you're building Amazon stuff, understand who you're building or building at the top of the Amazon ecosystem for people who are doing things like Roku or whatnot. Well, 80% of the value can be derived from some subset of services. So don't focus on the 5% service, focus on the 55% value service in that. And because what's going to happen is you box yourself in too early. So, um, you know, kind of understand what you're building and how you're building it. And also find every community, this is going to sound a little bit like Instagram influencing. And I guarantee you, People are going to land base me for this one, but it's it's actively actually true. There are tastemakers in every community, and yeah. if you understand who the tastemakers are in that community, you can understand that community really well. And th there's not thousands of them. There's likely not hundreds. There's probably dozens, maybe even less than that. Just understand those folks and what they're trying to go do, and engage with a couple of those folks on what you're building, and you'll get high high density, high yield feedback. Yeah, that's I think the last one. That's that's really really well valuable um, tactical advice. Um, probably we should move a bit um, away from the kind of product building focus in dev tooling, and look more inwards and kind of into organizations and the um, developer experience um, that um, orgs essentially provide to their own developers. That yeah. means ensuring that my devs are as productive as possible. Yeah. What would you say, what is um, today kind of GitHub's answer to that to that um, question? We, we use GitHub to build GitHub, um, <laughs> just like we use Roku to build GitHub. So GitHub at this point, um, mostly uses their own homegrown tools to, to build yeah. it. Um, we, have our, we have our own, uh, obviously we have actions, we have our own internal CI, CD, we have our own pipelines, all that sort of stuff. Um, I would say that um, I, I've become, I'm very privileged to have worked at GitHub and Roku, and you see this, these things firsthand. You can probably see some of the best of the best um, in terms of their internal tooling. What I will say is this: I'll say most organizations don't have a great internal tooling story. Um, what a lot of them do is end up trying to recreate a Heroku-like experience internally, not using Heroku but building on top of Kubernetes or something else that's kind of cobbled together. I would encourage those folks to think about. Um, taking that more seriously because a developer's productivity internally and their experience with the internal tools goes a long way to their satisfaction on, on the job. And also just honestly, their efficiency. If you have a build system that takes 30 minutes to run builds as opposed to two minutes, as opposed to 30 seconds, as opposed to incremental fractional builds, 
you, you, you're going to have a, a very different experience and engagement with work. Now, one of the things that I think our industry does poorly, which I think will have will, will get better over the next couple of um, years, is um, we will understand developer productivity and efficiency more. And I don't mean like big brother esque, like is Johnny or Sally or Susie productive. I mean, hey, we were able to do a thousand releases today. We were able to fractionally deploy and migrate X, Y, and Z services or whatever. Um, so a couple of the key metrics that I care about here are I like cycle time and I like mean time to recovery. And I not because they're super valuable metrics, but because it takes a lot of effort to understand if you can do a thousand releases a day or get mean time to recovery down minimally speaking, there's a lot of effort that goes into your entire internal development pipeline, internal development systems to get those things um, running smoothly. And um, I think that those are good ways for you to start tracking whether or not you're doing well or not there. Okay, yeah, that 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 makes a lot of sense. Um, so I think for a lot of devs that work in um, certain orgs and care about developer experience, it's probably sometimes hard to justify to work on that because it's you know not part of the actual stuff they're working on. Yep. Um, which oftentimes probably most likely is a function of how to quantify it. And I think the metrics um, um, you mentioned there, they, 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 they potentially help, um, help in, in that. But are, are there any other things um, where you say, hey, do that um, and tell that your VP um, of engineering or kind of um, what, what would you like to give developers um, um, at, their, at their hands to essentially um, justify to work on, on developer experience? So this is a very difficult question, I, I think, unfortunately, for me to answer, because um, I find that you, this is a little bit of a binary situation. The organization understands developer experience and developer productivity, or it doesn't. It doesn't, yeah. And if it doesn't, you're, it, what metric could you possibly give them to start yeah. selling them on developer experience? This is almost like we're in the dark ages in some organizations and sectors of the industry. Imagine going back to the 50s or 60s to talk about sales efficiency because it didn't quite exist yet. The entire concept didn't quite happen, but it happened in the 80s, sales efficiency in the 90s. So I think that much of the industry understands this and they'll spend money on dev tooling. But it wasn't even less, it was less than 10 years ago when most people said you can't make money in dev tools. And now obviously the golden age for dev tools because people are starting to realize that, you know, this is happening. Um, one last story and then I'll give you actual practical advice here too, but when I started my career, I was at IBM. And I remember when I started, I looked at my pay stub and it had like this code on it. And I looked, asked somebody what it was. And they said, oh, that's cost center. You are a cost to IBM. I'm like, well, I'm a developer. I'm like creating the thing that everyone's selling. Like, yeah, but we think of you as a net negative, like from a balance sheet perspective, it'd be better because you don't generate revenue. And it was like super head scratchy. I'm young. I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I don't understand this. Like how yeah, I don't generate revenue, but I'm generating the thing that generates revenue that somebody goes and sells. And I think that that mentality is not gone in the industry yet in some cases. Like, yes. wouldn't it be better if we didn't have to have all these costly engineers on staff to build these things? So, you know, I, I think that in, when, if you find yourself in a situation like that, it's going to be frustrating. My tactical advice to you is understand what the organization values. If it values... Um, uh, just pure dollars out or if it values features and functions being released and th that sort of thing. Talk about those things in conjunction with this. So if it's features and functions and release cycles, talk about the fact that developer efficiency is, is low leading to confusion or too large a cycle time, or you can understand your org better and kind of create a narrative around it. Metrics are going to be harder to come by, but you can probably find them too, but use the ones that matter to them, not to you. That's going to be one of the most important things that you, you do. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. Looking at the time a bit, um, and also to to close um, our quick chat. The final question is: What area do you think will significantly kind of also advance developer experience in the next two to three areas, or which area are you most um, exciting about? I think a couple of things are going to happen in, in together. Um, I think the entire data landscape is being rewritten on the fly right now. I think if you look at Snowflake and what it's doing for data warehouses and the kind of derivative things that are happening there. But if you've got, you've got Snowflake, you've got DBT, you've got Fivetrain, like the entire data ecosystem is being um, overhauled on the fly. Not to mention when, even once you get into the ML and AI space, 
over there for, for those things. So um, I'm pretty interested in what's gonna happen there. I think they'll start to get more um, tooling around their specific needs, which I'm very excited for, because as far as I'm concerned, that is, they're on the archaic end. If we're on the medieval end in the developer land, data is on the archaic end. Um, escape, I think that um, we'll see some people try and take another swing at Heroku, it hatches out. Um, and I think that we'll see more and more cloud native stuff happening. You, you've got your pod, we've got code spaces, we've got things that are out there. I think we'll, we'll try to bring more of that cloud native feel to, um, to developer experiences. And it's gonna be tricky to get right in a couple of scenarios, but I do think that we're gonna see more and more of that. Yeah, makes makes a lot of sense. And I think we definitely agree that, um, or that we're in the in the joint endeavor of moving kind of software development also Actually, more to the cloud. I, will, I would like to add one because I am super, um, I'm super big and bullish on edge and serverless. I think that serverless has a lot of potential for us to go do stuff. I think serverless is one of the um, most frustrating things in our industry because the developer experience is so poor. So I don't know if it's gonna happen, but I want it to. I want serverless to get a better developer experience um, somewhere, some way, somehow, because I think there's a whole lot of untapped potential for us in that. Great, yeah, I think we have we have Anurag from Render also speaking um, at FXCon, so, <laughs> so um, interesting to, to hear what he has to say about that. Thanks a lot, Jason. Um, I mean, that was a quick fireside chat, but I think um, definitely super, super helpful. Thanks for your time. And um, yeah, hope you hope you we will see you around in Discord. Thanks, Johannes. Thanks, everybody. Bye, bye.